Okay, today I am going to be sharing with you some information about uh, advantages between the North and the South during the Civil War. So we're going to go through this PowerPoint presentation together. Um, and be sure that you're taking some good notes because you will be using this later on um, as we go through this Civil War unit. And so the better notes you take, the more prepared you will be for some of your assessments, some of your things that you will be graded on. And as soon as my PowerPoint gets loaded here, we'll go right ahead and start. Here we go. 1861 to 1865. Please write those years down. Those are the years of our Civil War in this country. Um, again, I have you memorize very few dates within this class, but I do think that 1861 to 1865, those four years are very important. Um, you know, what's kind of interesting about this graphic uh, you see Abraham Lincoln right in the middle of this north and south, and that's done intentionally because Lincoln's really between these two countries, and yet he's trying to bring uh, the north or the union back together with the south, uh, the confederacy. And then these gentlemen that you see listed here uh, and here are some of the um, leaders of the Civil War as well, and we'll get to those um, later on in this unit as well. Civil War, the Union versus the Confederacy. All right, these are the flags uh, of both countries. Obviously, this one's very familiar to you because <coughs> that's our United States flag. What you have to keep in mind is that it did not have 50 stars on it <coughs> at the time of our Civil War. It only had, I believe, 30-something stars, which shows you that you know the country is is not yet in 1860 the way that it will look, you know, in present times. This second flag over here. Um, sometimes referred to as the Stars and Bars, also known as the Confederate flag. And I know a lot of you have probably seen that flag in pop culture, and we'll talk more about that flag as the unit continues. What you see pictured here are kind of the uniforms of both sides. We'll talk first about the Confederate uniform. Uh, the Confederates are sometimes referred to as the Grays because that is the style uniform that was worn by the Confederates. Sometimes you'll hear the Union referred to as the Blues. There used to be a college football all-star game played every year for you sports fans, and it used to be called the Blues versus the Grays. The Blues were uh, athletes from northern schools, and the Grays were athletes from southern schools. So <clears throat> even in today's culture, you still see uh, and hear the, the two groups both the Union and the Confederacy being referred to as the Blues and the Grays. As you take a look at this reenactor here first, you'll notice he has his canteen, he's got his Civil War backpack, uh, he's got his musket. This is very uh, accurate to basically what a soldier may have looked like during the Civil War. And again, even though this is an artist's depiction, you can see the exact same with the Union soldier. Um, Really, the only difference here is the style of hat. You can see this uh, is the style of hat that we'll be using for our reenactment. Um, you know, this style of hat, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, a little bit different, but uh, primarily the same. But again, both both these soldiers with canteens, both of them with back backpacks, both of them with muskets. I'm sure a lot of you know what this and this are with the soldier's uh, rifle or with their musket. Those are called bayonets, and those bayonets are literally used to stab your opposition uh, during combat. And so, you know, if, if you ran out of ammunition or once you started getting into the hand-to-hand -hand combat, you would actually um, fix your bayonet so you put it at the end of your musket, and then you would lunge toward your uh, opponent and basically try to, you know, gore them. Um, it, this was a very violent way of fighting during the Civil War, but it was reality of the war. And even in today's wars, uh, most of the time, bayonets like these are outlawed because just of how gruesome they really are. Um, but when soldiers were trained, they were actually trained how to use bayonets. And how you use them is you basically uh, stab into the person, kind of into their midsection, and then you stab upward more towards the heart and uh, lungs and other vital organs um, in an effort to, to basically, um, you know, destroy and, and kill your opponent. So 
Uh, the Civil War, in many ways, was a very vicious, very cruel war, and, and you can see that, you know, just with the way these two are pictured. But somewhere in your notes, please put that the Union typically uh, wears blue, the Confederates or the South typically wears gray. And you'll see in one of the movies we're watching, uh, some soldiers depicted in red, those soldiers will be Confederate soldiers, but primarily the color of Confederate soldiers is gray. I know a lot of you are probably having difficulties keeping track of what side is what, and so what I've done here um, is I've listed for you on either side all the different nicknames, all the different uh, things with each side, so you can kind of understand you know, which group um, is which. So on the left side, we're talking about the United States, the Union Forces, um, and, and these are all the different nicknames given to the North or to the Union or the United States. And you'll hear me refer to these different ways. You'll hear, um, you know, the, some of the movies, the some of the books, some of the readings that we'll do. They refer to them in different ways, and so I just want to make sure that you're able to to piece all these together. So please be sure you're writing all these down. The Union, the North, uh, the Yankees. Believe it or not, was another nickname for people in the North. So. For you baseball fans, if you think about the New York Yankees, it's actually kind of like the New York Northerners, because um, obviously New York was a northern state. The Federals, you will also hear the Union referred to as, obviously it's just the United States. They wore blue, as you're all well aware. Their president was Abraham Lincoln, and the capital city was in Washington, D.C. Now this is something I want you to think about. Uh, Washington, D.C. is located right between uh, Virginia and Maryland, and Virginia was actually a Confederate state, um, and Maryland, remember, is a slave state that still elected to stay with the Union, so Washington, D.C. was about as far south, really, as as you could get for a Union. It, it almost would have been made a lot more sense for the Union, uh, the United States forces, if their capital would have been further north, it would have been better protected, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the strategies involved with Washington, D.C., on the other side, you have the Confederacy, sometimes referred to as the rebels, uh, because you know they really rebel against what's happening in the North. They, you know they want to fight for slavery, they want to fight for what's happening, but they really rebel against the United States, and that's why they get their name, the rebels. Uh, some schools down south, in fact, still have this rebel nickname for their universities. Uh, the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss, is called. Uh, the Rebels, and their mascot is actually a, a little southern guy who dresses in, you know, gray and has little pistols, and I mean, they, they really play that up uh, in various parts of the South. They're also called the South Confederacy, obviously they wear gray. Their president is Mr. Jefferson Davis, and their capital is in Richmond, Virginia. So these capitals, Richmond and Washington, D.C., uh, very, very close to one another, and, and I think you'll see throughout the war that that's it's kind of an issue, or it's kind of at least a motivating factor um, for both sides. But again, be sure you have all this information down so you can keep these two groups straight. We're going to talk about a little bit uh, about the resources of both sides to the Civil War. We'll talk about the North or the Union first. When you divide everything up out of out of a hundred percent, so if if you take the North and the South, you combine them into what you know used to be the entire United States. This is how things would break down. The North actually has the advantage in total population, 71% versus only 29% to the South. So the North had a lot more people and a lot more people resources. Factory production, they had an even greater advantage. Again, we've talked about one of the differences between the North and the South is industry in the North versus farming in the South. And when you look at that, you know, the factory production, 91% of uh, America's factory output and the money made from factories is in the north, so uh, a lot more advantaged industry in terms of being able to manufacture weapons necessary for the Civil War. Railroad mileage. You know, in today's society, we don't think much about railroads, but when you're fighting a war in the 1860s, railroads are going to be extremely important because they're going to be able to transport troops. And as you can see, the north, the Union, had far greater, uh, you know, train and railroad resources and, and just a lot more miles of track, and that enabled them to really make sure that not only uh, soldiers but also goods could get from place to place, and so railroads were another advantage had by the North. This next step might be a little bit 
surprising to many of you, uh, but farmland, still 75% of it um, in the north. You know, we talk a lot about the plantations and the slavery in the south, but still a lot of farmland, even more farmland in the north. You know, when you talk about corn and some of the things grown in the Midwest, um, still more total farmland in the north than opposed to the south. But again, there's also more total land in the north than in the south. Cotton production, obviously, you can see just how popular this was, you know, in the Confederacy, how much they leaned on cotton for their daily existence. And again, on the cotton plantation, slaves were used to help harvest the cotton. They were the ones picking in the fields. They were the ones, you know, working uh, every day, day in and day out in these, in these fields. And so, you know, the cotton kingdom of the South really made the Confederacy, the majority of their money, and so this production from cotton was a huge part of the economy and it was a huge reason the Civil War occurs as well. But as you can see, most advantages clearly on the side of the Union, clearly on the side of the North. So we're going to list out here 40 uh, advantages of the North. Again, their population, their industry, their railroads. Um, two other things I want to make sure that you have some idea about. The North really controlled the United States Navy during the Civil War, which really was used at times to blockade southern ports. Again, the South makes their money by being able to export their cotton, by being able to trade the things that they produce in the Confederacy. And so the Union really felt, well, if we blockade their ports, you know, much like Great Britain did to us in the American Revolution, if we can keep the ships from getting in and out of the southern ports, we're going to cripple their economy and they won't have enough money to fight the war. And then the last advantage I have listed here is you, General Ulysses S. Grant. Some of you may have heard of Ulysses S. Grant before. He does become one of our American presidents. But prior to that, he's really a, a, a huge war hero in this Civil War. And so uh, be sure you have Ulysses S. name Grant down. Did I say that right? Ulysses S. Grant's name down because you will be learning a lot more about him um, throughout this unit. And he proves to be Lincoln's very best Union general. Now, Confederates really did have some excellent generals. And in terms of total amounts of generals that were skillful and, and that were helpful, um, I think you would almost give the advantage to the Confederacy. Many of you probably heard of Bobby Lee, Robert E. Lee, and, and also Thomas Stonewall Jackson. Um, these were some of, not all, but some of the Confederate generals that helped to win many battles, um, and really many in which they were even outnumbered. And we'll talk about that uh, as we go through the unit as well, about how Jackson and Lee in particular were able to really you know, take minimal resources, minimal soldiers, and still be very competitive uh, in, 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 and also win in many battles. Another advantage that the South had is most of this war is fought on southern soil. And it's much easier to defend one's home than it is to go attack on a, on a foreign soil or, you know, on an unfamiliar ground. You know, you have to keep in mind the Confederacy is familiar with their climate and their territory. You know, a possible psychological advantage. Again, it's like this home field advantage for those of you that play sports. You're going to know and feel more comfortable, you know, playing in your own environment. Just like the South is going to feel more at home fighting this war in the South. Imagine it this way. If you're playing paintball with your friends, would you rather have it would you rather be playing paintball at your house or at your friend's house? You'd rather play at your house because you're gonna understand all the different places to hide, you're gonna understand how things work there, and so most of the war being fought in the South was an advantage for the Confederates. And again, their profitable economy based on cotton. You know, this was an advantage for the South, but what we have to keep in mind is if the North could take away these cotton exports, if the North could eliminate these, you know, then the South really is not going to have the money and the funding that they need. And so keep that in mind um, for as we go through this unit. That's going to be all for this screen recording. Thank you very much for listening, and I will talk to you soon.